Hello, I'm Paul Michael Glazer, and you are watching Mr. Media. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Daniel Pine, writer, executive producer, and co-showrunner on J.J. Abrams' TV show, Alcatraz. While the series has come to an end, he has a dark new comic novel out, A Hole in the Ground, owned by a liar, that I'd wager is a whole new beginning. Stick around or you'll have to answer to Jorge Garcia in a very dark place. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of Hollywood screenwriters who plot out my every move on storyboards in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Hearing that a novel takes place in a mine is not the best way to get my attention for a spot on the show. Come on, a mine? And yet I've now fallen for that pitch twice with no regrets. The first was William Kent Kruger's thrilling Vermilion Drift, and now I'm recommending writer Daniel Pine's second novel, A Hole in the Ground Owned by a Liar. It's a very different story, an adventure with darkly comic overtones. Both books are page-turners. Eh, so much for anti-mind's prejudice. Now, Pine has an advantage as a storyteller in print. Besides having previously written a popular cult novel in 29 Palms, he's best known as a successful, experienced Hollywood screenwriter. For example, Pine was a writer on films such as Any Given Sunday, Pacific Heights, two really good Michael J. Fox movies, Doc Hollywood and the Hard Way, Fracture, the film version of Miami Vice, and the remake of The Manchurian Candidate. Last year, Pine gave his all to the Fox television drama Alcatraz, produced by J.J. Abrams and starring Sam Neill, Jorge Garcia, Sarah Jones, and Robert Forster. He was a writer, executive producer, and co-showrunner on the series, which was canceled after just one season. Now, if you're one of those people who still likes to discover a really good story, I heartily recommend Daniel Pine's A Hole in the Ground, Owned by a Liar. And Daniel Pine, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you. I love that introduction. Did you? Thank you. <laughs> Writing! Thank you! <laughs> uh, Thank you, John Lovitz. Um, you know, this is, a, uh, this is a really good story. It's well told. But, Dan, seriously, a mine? Wh wh who, who, who thinks a mine is going to be a good place to tell a story? Um, I did. But <laughs> the, the genesis of it was my brother, who, who, who is nothing like the brother in, in the book, actually bought a mine. He lives in Colorado, and in the mid-'90s, he bought a silver, I don't know, gold, silver. He bought a mine. You can, you can buy mining claims in the um, National Forest. Mm -hmm. In Colorado, you can buy these old claims that have been abandoned and usually filled up. And a lot of times people do it to build cabins or ski lodges or someplace, just a vacation house. And my brother bought it and then decided to open it up. And I went to visit him the summer after he bought it and after he'd opened it up. And he told me some of the stories of opening it up, which included opening it and having water drain out for a couple of days. And my, my knowledge of mines was basically limited to going to ghost towns and looking inside of them or watching movies about mines like Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And they were always dusty and dry. So I was kind of fascinated by him mucking around in these knee-high boots in this basically psychedelic yellow muck that he had to to um, get out of it before he could even do anything in it. And I, I sort of, it, it stuck in the back of my mind. And then a couple years later, there was a news story about a, a prospect, sort of a modern prospector down in Indonesia who was flying clients to buy, to, to look at gold mines that he claimed he had in the jungle. And it was all a scam, and it was unraveling on him, and he jumped out of a helicopter and, and, and died in the forest. He just committed suicide. He, he leapt out, or maybe was pushed out. 
So I knew that that was a good beginning to a story. I didn't know if it was a movie or a book. And then I had these two characters who were wandering around in my head looking for a place to play out their story. And I, I sort of wanted to combine all three elements. And I was very, I was very interested in writing another modern Western. I'd written um, White Sands early in my career. And that was about Santa Fe and New Mexico and, and an area that I visited as a kid. But I grew up in Colorado and I, I grew up in the mountains, going to the mountains, and I wanted to write about it. So it, it was kind of the perfect storm of things that came together. It, never, it was never really, for me, about a mine. It was more about the adventure of, of not knowing what what's in front of you of, of pushing forward and, and having an adventure and, th and that's sort of what the book is about as you know well and I think that's what made it so interesting for me it was, it was not uh, what I expected from a story that sort of was mind centric I mean it's not I, I, you know I, I over I, 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 I overstate the case it's not a story that the whole thing takes place in a mine obviously right. but, but the action is central to the mine and the mind is almost it's almost like a character within, um, and, and it's interesting that you you mention about the uh, the water and you you describe a, a there's a great scene where you know the fluids the water the liquids whatever is down there has come out of the mine and and floods all the way downhill down into the little town and right it's great I mean it's just like wow yep. yeah I think of those places as dusty too until I read this right and and then what happened was I I went to visit it once and I talked to my brother and he would tell me stories about it and I kind of forgot about him and as I was writing the book I just made up stuff I made up characters who I knew from from Colorado and and sort of put together this story and I was visiting I actually visited him last weekend and he'd read it and he'd written me this cryptic email saying that I got a lot of it right and I didn't really know what he was talking about because I'd made so much of it up. And in talking to him, I realized I stole a lot more from him than I thought. <laughs> so a lot of it happened. The, the draining of the mine, the EPA violations, the way he found the mine. Um, it, a, lot of the, a lot of the sort of specific details were, and that, and that feels really good, I think, in the story. It, it, it grounds it in a way. And it, it, I, one of the things that I like about storytelling is taking people to places they've never been, mm -hmm. whether it's a country they've never been or a situation they've never been, or in this case, a, a mine they've never been in. I definitely felt that way. I definitely felt that. And that was, I think that was another place that it's very successful is I, I definitely had the sense of being in a place that I had not been before. And actually, yeah, I mentioned in the introduction this uh William Kent Kruger book called uh, Vermilion Drift, which you probably enjoy having just read this. Yeah, you should and, read it. And it was the same type of thing, you know, because you're learning what a drift is, a drift mine, and, and uh, mm -hmm. talking about the different layers in the mine and what it's like in there. And, you know, it's, it's just, you don't, exp it's not something I would ever expect that I would be interested in. And yet, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I started reading your book and I, you know, it, it, over two days, I mean, it was the only thing I read. I just, I just had to keep reading and reading and, uh, you know, um, so uh, there's two brothers in the book. I should explain that there are two brothers in the book. There is a mine. Uh, there's two brothers. Gosh, you have a brother. What a surprise! Yeah, there, there were. He, my brother is is a lot older than me, so it really doesn't reflect our relationship. Um, but I was interested. I was sort of interested in, in examining some characters that I knew from growing up in Colorado West, particularly kind of specifically Western characters and mines. I should say that, that the gold rush and mines are an important aspect of the, the character of people who live in Colorado in the same way that, that, um, Elmore Leonard writes about South Florida and the crazy people in South Florida. There's a boom and bust mentality in Colorado that kind of permeates, the people who live there and people pick it up even when they move there. There's a there's a tendency for people to think that just one step away from making that quick killing that will set them up for life. And and I've always found that fascinating about it. So uh, you're going to deny at this point that either you or your brother had ever, ever slept with the other spouse? 
Yeah, it's certainly it, the the womanizing the womanizing ex con is closer to me than the school teacher the the wistful school teacher is close to my brother. But my brother reading it was totally happy that he was the hero. Right. He was he was he was into it all the way. So that excited him. He so he was he's proud of you, I guess. Yeah, I was surprised. I thought he would. I, I didn't know how self conscious he would be about some of the things I'd borrowed from his life, the specifics I'd borrowed. Um, and I just didn't know. I mean, I, I, I obviously, it, it, it's not reflective of our rela- relationship, and we have a great one, but I just didn't know. So I'm, I'm happy that he liked it. Uh, there's the two brothers are, uh, Lee and Grant. Now, uh, is that Lee Grant, the, uh, actress or is that Lee and Grant, the presidents or who, who where does Lee, Lee and Grant, Grant come from? Ge- Lee and Grant, the generals, the, the civil generals. war. Generals. Okay. The parents were civil war reenactors, which is a hard thing to do in Colorado because it wasn't really part of the civil war, but they did have a regiment that went, that went, um, to the civil war and, uh, Lee and Grant were named after the generals, and there is a kind of thread that I pulled through. Of uh, I, I actually read uh, Grant's biography, which is considered the best presidential biography, and then there's a the seminal volume of Lee's Grant's autobiography, Lee's biography, and I read them, and I kind of used tiny portions of them and i stole the uh section titles from lee's book but it i mean it was really because i was writing about the war between two brothers i was writing about a kind of civil war Mm -hmm. interesting all right well now there's one plot point that as a reader not as someone who's interviewing you here as a reader i just want to ask because i'm thinking maybe i missed it in uh in in reading um there's a point early in the book where uh, a, a, a detective comes and visits uh, Grant, right? Uh-huh. And, you know, kind of tips him off, and I'm being careful here because I don't want to give away a lot of plot, but kind of tips him off that something may be going on and he just sets that aside and pays it no mind. And is there a point later in the book where it he he puts two and two together and realizes that this detective has ha, ha, really did tip him off to something that happened later? Or do, is that never acknowledged? I don't remember it being acknowledged. It's, it's never directly involved in acknowledged. I think um, Grant kind of in, in the moment when the detective visits, he kind of he yeah no he never registers it because he doesn't have enough information to put it together. I never really connected those things. I was sort of ex- I was experimenting with this idea of using some of the mechanics of a conventional thriller Mm -hmm. but not playing them out sort of the familiar mechanics of a thriller to to give tension to scenes but not necessarily connecting them up because the story took you in different places so so grant knows that the that the detective visited lee knows some other parts of the story and we as readers know a third part of the story that neither one of them knows so we can kind of put it together as readers but Grant and Lee never, never quite do and never need to. Um, it just adds to, it sort of foreshadows where the story is going at the end. It, it, it makes us fear for their safety. And um, it plays out in a kind of interesting way. It sort of resolves itself at the end in a really interesting way. So I, I, it was definitely an experimental thing. Well, it was interesting because you're right. I mean, it, traditionally... They, at, at some point in a, a more traditional, traditionally told story, they would have gotten together and they would have put their different details together, but it never happens, and o- only the reader knows all those parts. And that's what I thought, but then as I was getting ready to talk to you tonight, I was thinking, did I miss that today? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that maybe you missed it. I did the same thing in 29 Palms. I took uh, uh, the structure of a conventional detective story, and I blew it apart the the main character you know normally in in that kind of story a kind of desert noir story the main character is accused of a murder and he has to prove his innocence and he stays in town and he's doggedly determined to to clear himself and in 29 palms he's accused of the murder and he runs away he flees like a coward 
and I, you know, I, I was interested in that. I was interested in doing things that I don't do when I'm writing films or writing television. Well, and thank you. You, you just gave me a beautiful segue into uh, what I wanted to ask you about, which is uh, you've been doing uh, TV and film for, I don't know, 25, 30 years, I guess, right? Uh-huh. And um, you've only done a couple of books, and I wondered, is that because you've been so busy with film and TV, or do the, are the books harder to do, or what's the... I, I started out writing prose fiction. I came out of college intending to write prose fiction, and... Um, I got into film school and I got distracted by writing screenplays. And it, at first I thought I would, I would be able to support myself writing serious fiction by doing one television script a year or something, you know, something that would just support. But I was both um, intrigued by screenwriting and I also realized that people who did it really well took it very, very seriously. So I kept writing prose, but... I sort of thought maybe screenwriting was gonna was where I was gonna want gonna stay and where I would wind up. And then as time went on, I still missed the kind of storytelling that you can do in a novel. I missed the 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 sense of finality of writing a piece of prose and having people read it. Where a screenplay is just an agreement. It, it, it's a way to get a bunch of people to agree to make a movie. Yeah. Uh, so I went back. So I went back to writing novels, and it took a long time. The first, the first one took forever to write because I was doing it at night, and I wasn't very confident about it. It was, you know, it was a, a host of things. But, but I always intended to go back to it. It just took a little longer than I thought. Which is, uh, I'm guessing that the screen screenwriting is uh, easier for you in some ways. Um. Hmm. No, I th they're diff they're very different, but uh, the storytelling is kind of the same. So the building of the story, the building of characters, the writing of dialogue, uh, where novels are, uh, I get to wind out a little bit more. I get to do, I get to be a little more poetic and a little more lyrical. Screenwriting is very difficult because you have to, you have to communicate thoughts and paint pictures with as few words as possible which is very difficult um screenwriting is probably a little easier because it's shorter because it's 120 pages as opposed to you know 350 uh -huh. or 400 but but they're they're the same i mean in in terms of maybe in terms of time they're they're different but in terms of the energy that i put into them i find they're the same it's the same thing people have asked me before if television is easier than movies because it's shorter but it ha it isn't for me i i spend the same amount of time writing a pilot as i might spend writing a screenplay so and uh the, the actual writing of it i mean for example you worked you you wrote and um, produced on uh, alcatraz for the past year and uh, -huh. uh that i'm guessing you know when you write for something like that you're probably doing it uh in a in a bungalow or on on studio somewhere as opposed to sitting at home like maybe where you would write the book or am I just uh, am I off off the base there? Oh, you're right. Uh, television is very collaborative. You you have an office, you have a staff, and Alcatraz was extremely time intensive. I didn't have time to do anything else. Television tends to eat your time away because you're shooting twenty two. You're doing twenty two stories as opposed to just one. Uh, the 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 pace of it is much quicker, and it would it would have been hard for me to write a book if I was doing television full time. I think, um, and I, I I did television for a long time, but I hadn't really done it for about eight years, eight or nine years. I'd just been doing screenplays mm -hmm. and working on the books. So uh, the book I, I I gather was done before you got involved in Alcatraz. Yeah, Alcatraz. I st I came in in the mid. I kind of came in in the middle. Oh, okay. I didn't it, realize was, that. it was. It um, was. Yeah, the truth can now be told. Uh, it. They had shot six and a half episodes and then shut down because of many creative questions, production problems. Um, a create a kind of creative difference between the the showrunner, co-creator, 
and the studio and the network. There was just a disconnect. This sometimes happens on shows. So they shut down, and I was brought in originally just to work for three weeks on some reshoots of the first six episodes to kind of clean some things up. But when when the showrunner quit, I agreed to stay, and I wound up staying for five months. But I started I started in the middle, so I was I came in right. I'd never done that before, um, and. From the time I was there, from the time I started until I finished, I think I had probably four days off. Wow. Yeah, it was it was very intense. I mean, it's fun in to do it in that short time frame, but it was it was hectic. Well, okay, so we've kind of we, we've kind of slid over a bit to uh, Alcatraz. So let me ask you about that for a minute or two, and we'll come back to the book in a minute. Um, I, I have to admit, I did not see an episode of Alcatraz. I I, 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 okay. And, and, and I, I'm, you and millions of, of others. Well, and you know, and I wanted to ask you about that because I wanted to ask you where you think, especially now that I know you came in, you know, after six and a half episodes had been shot, I wondered kind of where you thought the show may have gone wrong. And the, the two things, well, the, I, I had a couple of, I had a couple of thoughts, even though I never saw the show. I want to throw this out and then get your response if I could. Uh huh. Um, the, the the main thing that struck me and the reason I didn't watch it was I just couldn't – and I didn't watch Prison Break on Fox either for that matter. But I, right. I, 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 I just thought, why do I want to watch a show about Alcatraz every week? That, that I never got past that. But then the huh. other thing is um, – I, I, well, okay, the two other things. One is I thought that – I suspected that this was something that was more – uh, J. J. Abrams project in name rather than in actuality because he's got Star Trek going on and uh, Mission Impossible and whatever else. And then the other thing is that it seemed like it was sold largely um, with uh, uh, Jorge Garcia's uh, appeal coming off of Lost. But I, I, I may, I, I wonder if I'm one, of, if I'm in in the majority or the minority of people who love the guy, find him very charismatic, but didn't really see him as a guy who was the lead on on a show. Uh, and am, am I am I close on any of those? Do you think? Um, let's see. Uh, it was a JJ show. I mean, he didn't create it, but he was very involved. He was he was the person who brought me in and hired me. Um, he was very, very involved and and very excited about it. Um, Scratch that one then. Okay. Uh, Jorge, I don't know what to say. I think I think he's great. Um, I think. Perhaps his character was never carved out enough. Um, but but I think what happened was it was a lot of the people involved with it, including JJ, came off of Lost with a template for how shows might be done and for how you might do a show by just surprising people every week and not really knowing where you're going. And the problem was that the show that they, the problem was that in Lost you could do that because Lost at its core was about a group of people who crash landed on an island and had to survive. It was Survivor. So no matter what else you did in the show, there was this, you kept coming back to that fact. You could always come back to the fact that they were on the beach and they had to build things. You had, you had tangible things to do. Alcatraz was this weird mix of a period show because part of it, the Alcatraz part of it took place in 1960. Mm -hmm. It was a a little bit of a sci-fi time travel show because you had these prisoners from 1960 coming back in 2012. So you had to explain there was a, there was a mythology that, that was bubbling beneath it. And then a good part of the show, I think, was expected to be a procedural, catching these guys. And it was not a good, it, it, it just wasn't created in a way that lent itself to procedural. There wasn't enough mystery to the present day stories because the guys were coming back, but you knew who they were, you knew what they were. And you had to spend a certain amount of time doing that. And that meant that the show, you had to have a sense of where the show was going all the time. And I don't think when they started out and shot the first half of the season, they had any idea really where it was going. They they probably had a, 
a, a sense of it, but but maybe not. And and part of the part of my job was to come in and and tie tie stuff together that may not have been intended to have been tied together when it was originally thought of. It it was it was challenging. I mean, I, I think by by the end of thirteen, we had kind of accomplished what we kind of accomplished that, and and the show was on solid footing, but it lost just enough audience that Fox was soft on it. They had other options, um, and maybe you know maybe it it had a really hard. I was surprised it had a hardcore audience that would email us and. Oh. We went to WonderCon, and they were all there, and they they loved it, and they followed it religiously. People watched it every week, um, and and it had a great launch. But the the odds against a show making it are really high. So, you know, they, I I think it was a I think it was a a good effort. I think, I mean, personally, I think you're right. I think it was flawed on on some basic conceptual level it may have been flawed and we couldn't quite get over that by the time we got our a handle on it it's also true sometimes with tv shows that it takes a while to find them Uh um another jj show fringe i think benefited from the fact that it was on on friday night and uh they sort of let it run out and it found itself person of interest same thing another jj show and it they kind of find themselves after half a season and this show just didn't get that much time to try to, to try to. Yeah. They may have said to, to JJ, Hey, listen, we're going to keep one of these two shows. Which one do you want? Yeah. Uh, do you want to wrap up fringe? Do you want an extra season to wrap up fringe? Or do you think you can make a go of Alcatraz? And they yeah. may have said, let's, let's take fringe to its end. Are you, I mean, are you, uh, you know, when you come to the end of something like this, as you did, uh, do you reach a point where you're like, yeah, okay, I'm I'm prepared to move on, and you you because you weren't there at the very beginning, but you did come in and and, and fix it essentially. Uh, I was I was disappointed that it didn't get picked up because that was the job that I was that that I came in to do that I intended to do that was my goal, um, but I never intended to stay after one season. I made a deal just to come in for the 13 episodes, mm. and that was it. So I I, I was. I put myself into it. I I spent every day on it, and then I knew that when when we wrapped the last episode, that would be the end for me. So um, I I didn't have any expectations beyond that. I I uh, <laughs> I just thinking about this. I had my own uh, t- uh, uh, taste of uh, the Hollywood uh, cancellation uh, pickup uh, in in May this year. Uh, let's tell you this quickly. Maybe you can relate to this. I I found out that a book that I had I, I had co-written called uh, The Profiler two years ago, it we knew it had been picked up by Warner Brothers Television, and that was uh-huh. the last we heard two years ago. And then beginning of May, um, suddenly uh, I and my co-author got checks that said that they were for pilot, and we didn't know anything about it. I mean, literally, we had no idea that anything had gone on. And so this is on Wednesday. Thursday, we find out from our agent that, oh, yeah, uh, Warner Brothers, uh, they shot a pilot. Uh, Jerry Bruckheimer produced it. And we're like, Jerry Bruckheimer produced it? <laughs> what? I mean, you know, to go from zero to, to 120 suddenly. Yeah. And it was uh, – so it was called Trooper. It, the pilot was a – I guess it was a 90-minute pilot starred uh, Mira Sorvino. And so we found out – we got it confirmed on Thursday. So we had a very exciting day on Friday knowing that CBS was going to announce its schedule over the weekend. And we're like, oh, my God, this is incredible, you know. <laughs> and then by Saturday morning, uh, Deadline.com was saying that CBS had passed on Trooper. And we we're like, oh, my God. <laughs> we only had 24 hours of fun with this, you know. Yeah. Oh, that, my God. That's funny that you didn't know anything about it, that you didn't know it had been shot or anything. Not a thing. I – I knew uh, when they picked up the uh, uh, the option uh, on the book, uh, it was April of 2010 because we got very small checks for the option. Uh-huh. And then I guess it was like a two-year option. I think it expired uh, in May. And so I guess they had to do something with it or not. And then, But then to find out that Jerry Bruckheimer had it. And then suddenly, you know, I'm, I'm, we're in this weird situation of, you know, we're rooting against existing shows. We want something to be dropped so that they pick yeah. up this one. 
and unfortunately we had the it, you know i i never got to see the pilot i probably never will i don't know if it'll ever air of course but uh it, we it was a rough year because they had uh this uh, sherlock uh uh uh, spinoff or not spinoff but the americanization of sherlock holmes right uh, called elementary and apparently that was a lock everyone was high on that because the um uh, the british show was such a big hit why they right. didn't just bring over the british show i will never understand you know cbs should have just paid the money and brought that and put it of- on yeah they never they never do that it's all it, partially because they don't shoot enough of the british shows they only shoot three of them or six of them yeah so they don't have enough to, to fill a season but yeah, I wonder that too. I wonder why they keep taking these formats and and redoing them when the original show is so good. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I'm I'm sorry. I didn't mean to take away well, that's from your exciting. story. Yeah, I was. No, just, that's exciting. I, I you know I'd never uh, never crossed paths with uh, with Hollywood in that way, and and to do it in such a big way suddenly was like wow. But I yeah, I, and welcome to my world. The sort of zip up the wall and splat flat rat down again oh it's just uh, I, I just can't imagine doing it every year of having that you know aggravation and, and emotion it's just yeah you find yourself uh, like i said i mean there, there's a weird bittersweet quality to writing film and television because you really are you're not quite doing the end product you're you're writing an agreement uh, an agreement you're writing a blueprint for something that a bunch of people will then come on and collaborate to make Mm. and that can be fun and it's you know it's a good contrast to sitting alone and writing something but at the very point when you know the most about your story and your topic you give it away you give it to other people who then bring their stuff to it Mm. and and my experience in film has often been you give it to a director, he tears it apart because he doesn't understand it, and he now has to internalize it. And he takes you on a development loop that is generally a circle, and you wind up pretty much back where you started. But he's convinced that he has to go on that journey. They're all decisions that you've made and rejected and you know that have led you to where you were when he picked it up. But now he has to go on that same journey. <laughs> Yeah, it's aggravating. Well, let me ask you about. I want to ask you about one, just one of the films that you've worked on. It's because I, I really, I, I love this movie, uh, Pacific Heights. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Great thriller. Uh, I can still visualize the, uh, the, the, uh, the streets in San Francisco. That because I've never, yeah. I've been to San Francisco, but I've never been on the streets that are so famous in the movies. You know, they're all downhill and everything. Um, I don't know exactly how involved you were in that i wonder if you could tell me that and then just tell me a little bit about the about the movie whatever you're comfortable with it was great it was a great experience it was john schlesinger who directed mm-hmm. midnight boy and um and he kept me involved all the way i was involved from the from the get go it was a it was a spec script that i wrote also partially from real life uh, at the very beginning of my career um, my wife was still involved in music in San Francisco. And we wanted to keep an apartment in San Francisco, and we figured out that if we, not Pacific Heights, but if we bought a building and we rented out two of the two of the units, we could afford to keep one, and it would be cheaper to keep one. So, uh, so we did. We you know we mortgaged everything and we bought this building and immediately had a problem where a guy moved in and then would not leave he didn't pay he wouldn't leave and in the process of getting him evicted which we did without too much trouble i heard all these stories from lawyers and realtors about things horror stories about what happens to landlords and to people just because of of the laws that that govern evictions that are correct. The law is is indifferent. And if you work it right and the people you're working against don't don't understand it, you can take advantage of it and you can do a lot of things. So so it started as that and then it quickly became a thriller and and um, John came on and shot it so beautifully in San Francisco. It's actually not shot in Pacific Heights. It's Potrero Hill, which is south of San Francisco, but looking back on it, that view was just tremendous. Mm. It was it was a great experience. Uh, for people who haven't seen it, it's Michael Keaton, Matthew Modine, uh, Melanie Griffith, Melanie. 
and, and then there's a bunch of other people who, I don't have the list in front of me, but a lot of other familiar names who pop up in that film as well. Yeah, sort of a John Schlesinger repertory company, or, or maybe an American fine actor repertory company, because everyone wanted to work with John. Um, even in the process of casting it, Kevin Spacey came in, and um, I can't remember who else. Melanie was attached to it from the from the beginning. She was coming off of Working Girl mm-hmm. with Harry, big hit. Big hit. which is a huge hit. Um, and a bunch of people came in for the Matthew Modine role, and then he he signed on. So, yeah, he had a he had a great group of really fine actors playing Lori. Um, Metcalf. Laurie Metcalf from Roseanne, um, Dan Hedaya. Um, I can't remember who else. It was a while ago. Well, but I yeah, thinking, that was. I was just thinking that uh, actually Melanie Griffith coming off of Working Girl had just worked with Mike Nichols and then to go work with John Schlesinger. I mean, you know, she had was, she had quite the career going at that moment. Yeah, and Michael Keaton was coming off of Batman. Yeah. There's actually a very tiny nod to Batman in it when he triggers the the key fob on his Porsche and all the windows go up and it locks, uh, kind of like the Batmobile. Interesting. Okay, see, now I, I was thinking as we were getting ready to talk about this, uh, well, I mean all of this, I was thinking, now I want to go back and see that. I want to see if that's on Netflix and I want to I watch that again now. Yeah, it's still, it's, it holds up remarkably well. Yeah, that was a great, I mean, it, it was a great film. Yeah, it's 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 kind of iconic in in its way, and and John really did a great job. Now, uh, without giving away anything that happened, uh, uh, conclusion of um, uh, Hole in the Ground, owned by a liar. Uh, is there any chance we might see any of those characters again in another book? Uh, doubtful. Okay. Doubtful. Don't think. I don't think there's. I don't think there's anywhere. That you, I, I thought about taking it further when I was writing the story. Initially, I thought it might go another whole half, but I don't think so. I think they're pretty much resolved. Okay. I don't want to say anything uh, on the air because if I did, I would have to give away what happens at the end, and I don't want to do that. But right. I, I I, just came away from it thinking that there's another story to be told. That's just my opinion. Um, Maybe I might come back to it. I mean, it's so, it's so recent. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. In the, in the meantime, I have other things that I've been working on, so I haven't really thought about going going and, back to it. And, and and hence, that's where I wanted to wrap things up. What is uh, next? Uh, your schedule is is your schedule clear, or is your schedule tied up now? It's it's right now. It's it's a little clear. I I finished. I I've been working before Alcatraz. I've been working on a movie for the French film company Studio Canal, mm-hmm. adapting uh, a movie that they have in their library, sort of loosely adapting a movie that they have in their library and going back to the text that it was based on. Um, so I was, I've, I've been working on that and now we're trying to put it together and we have a, a this great director, Morton Tildum, who is Norwegian and has a hot international film called Headhunters that just came out and got great reviews. And now we're going to try to put an actor in it and then put it together. It's sort of the way, there's sort of two ways movies are being made now. One is you get a comic book and you spend $200 million or or, or make a big movie. Or, or like some of all fears, you get a Tom Clancy novel and you make a big tentpole movie. Or you write a good script, you get a good director, you get a good cast, and then there's... There are lots of independent financing that you can put together to make it, and then you get a studio to distribute it. Mm. So we're kind of going down that road. So I'm, I, I came back to that and finished it up, and, and we're out working on that. And then I, I'm almost at the end of a new manuscript for a third book. Oh, very good. And have you sold the option on a Hole in the Ground? No. Oh. <laughs> no. No, I sort of – I have to say – it would be great if somebody wanted to do that, yeah. but coming, you know, you come, if I were a, if I were a book writer, I might feel differently about it. But one of my goals writing novels was to write novels that weren't movies that maybe couldn't, they could be interesting movies, but they, but they, I, I wasn't looking for them to be adapted into movies. I wanted them to live and breathe as novels. It's a, you know, I get re- very sensitive about being a screenwriter who writes 
books because there's a kind of perjurative that comes with it of, of oh, you're just going to write basically a long treatment and you're going to write like a screenwriter and it's going to just be all all dialogue and a little bit of description and no in, no interior lives for anybody. Uh, so I was very sensitive about that. I I I love novels and I I want to do them justice. So when I'm writing them, I never think about am I making a move that might might make a good idea for a movie or um, this one. I think you know it would be great if someone wanted to make it. If Paul Thomas Anderson wanted to make this it would be fabulous but i don't think it's a big studio film so no i agree i i think it's 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 not a big studio film but it's got you know it's got movie written all over it i mean i just as i hadn't thought this out before but i was actually thinking that uh, i could actually see uh, matthew mcconaughey as uh, as grant i don't know who would yeah. play lee but i mean he'd be the perfect uh, grant um i the, there was some interest it did get sent out by agents to uh a few actors who pairs of actors who wanted to play brothers mm. and I think their production companies read it to, to sort of see if it was something that would interest them and hey. I haven't heard anything yet it's only been a few months though so Schwarzenegger and DeVito it's perfect for them <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> all right um listen folks you can find uh, a hole in the ground owned by a liar and yes I do keep referring to uh to notes because it's a long title and I'm not that it's good at remembering long anything long um uh, uh, by writer uh, Daniel Pine. Uh, it's in great bookstores everywhere. Or you can order it right now at a great price at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Uh, Daniel, Excellent. I know you... I'm sorry? Excellent. Excellent. Yes, order it here. Order it here. Help support your favorite Mr. Media uh, podcast. Uh, right. I know you've got the website, Daniel Pine, P-Y-N-E dot com. Uh, can uh, fans find you on uh, Twitter or Facebook, any of those places? Uh, there's a Facebook page. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of social media, but yes, there's a Facebook page that I'm trying to pay attention to, and I'm going to try to pay a little more attention to my website. Um, I teach it at UCLA Graduate School of Film, hmm. so I may. I'm trying to figure out a way to do a forum where people can write, ask me writing questions, because I get. I get lots of them. I get lots of them from old students. They email me all the time and ask me kind of really fascinating character questions, plotting characters or, or business questions. And I thought that might be an interesting way to communicate with people. It might be something I can give back to the writing community. So, so stay tuned. If you go on the website, uh, there may be a forum showing up shortly. Sounds like a book waiting to happen, too. <laughs> Sounds like a yeah, I, I swore I swore I would never write a how to write screenplays book, and I I think I'll hold to that. All right, we'll see in a couple of years. You may feel differently. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, listen, maybe a fictional one. Uh, that, well, that you know that could be interesting. Uh, Daniel Pine, a lot of fun talking to you. Really enjoyed the book. Can't stress that enough. And uh, thank you so much. My pleasure, and thank you for, so much for joining us in Mr. Media today. Really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows, get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then, it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin. Here's The Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The Tech Crunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, BlackBerry, Droid, and more. 
and show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. That's stitcher.com slash MR Media. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com, and tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening.